Hi everybody. So we have this idea in our heads that we make progress. We make progress from a, a time when we're stupid to a time when we're clever and right now we're clever and therefore our ancestors must have been stupid. Now that may or may not be true but it does lead us to the assumption that our stupid ancestors with their stupid ideas aren't worth listening to. And that I totally disagree with. I think there are some great ideas if we look in the past to help us with our problems in the future. Now, of course, we're in a bit of a crisis. It's uh, winter in the Northern Hemisphere and prices are high and we're all cold and worried about that cost. When you think about what we do, it was in sort of the 20th century or so, we had um, forced air heating, convection heating. We basically heat the air up. That heats the entire building and it keeps the building nice and warm and toasty and we can wander around in a t-shirt and shorts living happy lives. That's fine when you can actually afford that because heating an entire building is a big mass and of course that costs a lot. Now our ancestors didn't rely on convection heating. They relied mostly on conduction and radiant heating. If you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, have a look at video 1758 where I go into a bit more depth about the different types of heating styles they are. But radiant heating is basically an open fire that radiates heat at you. Conduction heating is basically a heated brick and sit that on your lap and you're going to get warm because it conducts the heat through. They were the kind of things that our ancestors were using and they were heating what's called microclimates. They were heating small areas of the building rather than the entire building. And of course, if you think about it, in cost terms that makes sense because the area, the mass you're heating, is so very much smaller, it's going to cost you less to heat it. My wife talks about this actually, she says when she gets cold and goes into a cold area, it's almost insufferable. But if she's warm and goes into a cold area, she can do what she needs to do and then come back and get warm again. And we all know that. Just go out in winter and make a snowball when you're freezing, come back in and warm up. Then you can go back out into the cold again and have some fun. So it's a very sensible strategy that we use when we're outside versus inside, but we're not really using when we're inside. But our ancestors, well, that's exactly what they did. Now, when you think about heat from radiation, infrared heat, of course, there are a couple of issues there. One is, uh, it goes down by the square of the distance, because it's all radiating out like that, it gets very much weaker the further you are away you are from that radiant heat source. And the other is, radiant asymmetry. So if you're facing a radiant heat source and it's bathing you nicely in its radiation, like getting a suntan, that bit gets warm. The back bit gets cold and so you want to put yourself on a spit and turn around so that you get the other bit warm because it's asymmetrical in the way it actually hits you. Because none of this escaped our ancestors. What they would do are some very clever tricks that involve manipulating those two aspects of things. Perhaps the first one, quite simply, a hooded chair. A hooded chair solves two problems at once. It creates a microclimate by insulation and being near the radiant heat source, that is near the fire, it traps effectively more of that radiant heat. Apparently wearing these, uh, using a hooded chair is equivalent to wearing a thick jumper and a thick coat indoors. So pretty effective and you do pretty much the same kind of thing if you get a radiant heater and stick it under your desk. What you're doing is creating a microclimate under that desk and of course the desk has got a backboard in it so the heat only has one way to go and that's to wash over you while you're sitting in a chair which is no reason that you feel so much toastier if you put a radiant heater under your desk. You're doing exactly what our ancestors did with things like hooded chairs. Another way of creating a microclimate was something like a folding screen. They were winter furniture, dragged out, heavily padded or made of thick wood, and they were put behind you so that the radiant heat was bounced back at you, and you didn't get a draft up your back to take care of the radiant asymmetry. Third idea, of course, was to put seating within the fireplace, and who doesn't want an ingle nook fireplace? So just a couple of seats actually in the fireplace, creating again that microclimate in which you could stay warm. Of course having a fixed spot where you get the heat and take advantage of that can be a little bit inconvenient and portable heating solutions were not unknown. The Dutch used something called a foot stove. 
basically a wooden box with holes in it and you chucked some heated bricks in there and chucked a blanket over your legs and you were nice and toasty warm. Now these things are made out of ceramics, tile, stone, wood, all kinds of things and they weren't only restricted to the Dutch, there was a worldwide use of them. So in Japan for instance they had a very small coffee table with a brazier underneath the coffee table and you would sit there with your legs under it in a thick blanket over the coffee table and of course you were nice and toasty. Of course, singularly, the most well-known heat source is the conductive heat source, which is the hot water bottle. Really simple thing, just a ceramic or rubber container filled with hot water that would heat something with conduction just by putting it in there, like on your belly or in the bed. And of course, bed warmers were um, used for centuries, and they're basically just a metal pan with some embers in there or some hot bricks. Stick it in the bed and let the bed warm up. And of course, beds at that time had heavy drapes around them to create that microclimate that we've been talking about. Okay, so I'm not really suggesting we go back to open fireplaces and carrying hot, hot embers around the house. But I am suggesting that we take this idea of microclimates and heating the person, not the place, a little more seriously than we think. And we think that we all lead these amazingly active lives, but actually it's just something we tell ourselves. The average daily view time of television is something like three to four hours. That means when you get in from work, you get your stuff done, eat your dinner, you spend the rest of the evening in front of the telly, pretty much which is astounding if you think about it, but you're sitting in one spot while you do that. It's extremely rare to watch television while learning how to juggle. You're sitting there in one place, and so if you heated that place, most of the time you're going to be perfectly comfortable and perfectly happy, and then of course you go to bed, in which case just heat the bed. So I am suggesting that we look at this microclimate idea a little more in light of new technology. So things like heated seat pads that we made uh, here for use here. That thing I told you about the radiant heater under the desk. They're successfully creating microclimates with things like carbon heaters. And of course carbon heaters are stunningly easy to make that will get warm enough on a few volts to keep you nice and toasty. So there isn't that much that needs to be done to keep you comfortable and warm. It's really just a question, I think, of changing some of our attitudes and yes it's a compromise but when times are hard you have to make compromises an unfortunate truth I think anyway I hope it made you think thank you very much for watching the video and please do remember to like and subscribe